Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for a special live screening of Song Without a Name, Cancion Sin Nombre, Peru's official entry for the 2021 Academy Awards. Uh, the film runs about 97 minutes and we'll share it here directly in the webinar. Following the movie, we'll go directly into a live Q&A with writer, director, producer, and editor, Melina Leon. Um, please stick around. We'll take questions from the audience and um, I'll see you in about 97 minutes. Thanks. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the Q&A. It's my honor to welcome up the writer, producer, director, editor of the film, Melina Leon. And uh, Melina, if you have your... Perfect. Hi, right. hi Alex. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank Are you, you in the room right now? Yes. Ah, great. Um, so uh, this is such a devastating story. And I know from reading a little bit about it that a lot of it was inspired by things that really happened and really happened in a way that uh, uh, your father was also directly involved in, in uncovering a lot of the, um, the, the trafficking that was happening. Um, so I'd like to start there as sort of, you know, the, sort of the inspiration point for you. Um, what made you want to tell this story and how did you uh, work through some of the uh, events that unfolded in your father's past to tell this story? Sure. Um, well, I had heard of this story because it was the first um, newspaper they printed. Um, it's the newspaper La República, the Republic. Um, and this was their first headline. It was actually something like judges involved in the traffic of children uh, abroad. And um, of course, it was their first headline. It was very meaningful, and also just emotionally, he he would react just like anybody else. Like being a journalist, um, he had seen in Peru, he had seen everything, as you can imagine. But still, this was shocking for him. And so we kind of knew this story, but it was the way it came back that really made me think oh i should probably make a film about this about this because it was like 30 years after it happened that my father got a phone call from a french lady who turned out to be one of the babies that got stolen who wanted to meet him and just thank him chat him become you know closer because uh, she had discovered an entire she had come back and reunited with her mom and you know, she was uh, she was learning everything about her past. So I guess my father was in a way part of her past. So yeah, they did. And he told me this. I was uh, at the time I was living in New York, um, and it had like obviously a, a meaningful emotional impact, like it would have for anybody. Uh, but on the other hand, in, in particular for me, because I wasn't living in Peru, and I thought for my first film, I want to make something that I can really remember somehow, like something that I really know about. And I think that uh, there's nothing like your childhood memories of an environment that you can speak about in, in a better way, like you're in the best position to tell a story that you remember so that comes so so much from your from your childhood, your unconsciousness, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought she's coming back to discover her past, Celine, uh, the Peruvian French lady, and I, I should come back to. Um, I, I'm sorry. Before we get to the film, I'm just too fascinated by that story of the woman coming back. Did she? How did she even trace her her roots? Well, it all began because she had her own ch ch child and she just wanted to to know uh, her biological mother. And I think they kept some uh, they kept some uh, clue on how to get in touch. And uh, it wasn't that easy, but they managed with her husband. I'm not exactly sure how they found her. 
but uh, I, I, what I remember is that they had a clue that their adopting parents had a way to, oh, for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, stories like these are often, you know, they, they often expose things that have the complicity of governments and police and various, you know, um, bureaucratic people that go beyond just the criminals and therefore are potentially sort of dangerous to tell. And I'm curious how open um, people were in your research process to figure out kind of how this was happening, how it operated and all of that, uh, given the fact that it is shedding light on something that I'm sure many people would prefer not to, uh, to have on earth. Yeah, that's why um, some, we, we made it a fiction because yeah, we didn't want to find any, any trouble in our way. I knew though that my, ha my dad was menaced when he was researching all this because they ended up in jail, just like in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like the kids never came back, but, uh, but they did end up in jail. So from jail, they were sending menacing letters to my father saying this, this and that. Like, um, but for us, it was more like, well, let's make it a fiction film. We changed the, the year, right? This actually happened in 81. We, we moved it to 88 to be able to speak about that, that memory of us, which is like the, the worst part of the crisis of the 80s, um, because I don't remember really the beginning of the 80s. And, uh, and the worst was at the, towards the end. So I wanted to link um, this case to to that memory of that that atmosphere that I could remember. So let's let's talk about the two main characters. Um, let's start with Pedro because it's uh, still very much unusual to see LGBT themes in films from Latin America, um, and this is you know obviously very moving in the eighties. I can imagine uh, it would have been quite dangerous for him. Uh, can you talk a little about wanting to to write that kind of a character? Sure. Yeah. Well, it was a um, very personal thing where I was feeling on uh, several drafts that uh, the character was becoming some sort of like typical hero, uh, male, like heterosexual hero that um, saves the lady or tries to save the lady. And if there is something that I had clear on my mind was that I just was trying to avoid stereotypes or I was just trying to make an honest film and therefore not present Pedro as a perfect hero that uh, gives everything to, for her, his case. I wanted him to also have a personal life, you know, to be a character that has other things going on and loves what he does and wants to help, but also happens to fall in love, happens to have a family, happens all these things. And um, so because he was inspired a little bit of my father, I thought, well, he's going to be, he's not going to be gay. And, and then I, I, it felt like it was going towards that stereotype, right? So I, I thought, no, this is so boring. <laughs> no, this is, a, he's like witness. Like um, he doesn't know uh, on his skin what it's like to be marginalized, right? Mm. Like he's too comfortable. And I, I'm sure everybody, like all the spectators, the audiences are know and feel for the other, right? Um, just like everyone, like, when we watch a movie, we feel for it, for the characters, but it's not the same to, to feel it, you know, to experience, right? Uh, what it's like to be marginalized in a, such a country like Peru, that it's so backwards in so many ways. So I, I changed it and I, right away I felt comfortable <laughs> with him and I felt uh, empathy for him. And, yeah, it, 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 that was the process of um, Pedro and his little story behind the thing. So tell us about Georgina, the uh, the incredible, 
journey that she has in this film, I mean, is it's so powerful to see her go in and fight for finding her baby. Um, and it's really what, you know, it's obviously in the film, it's the catalyst for the investigation. And I'm curious if that uh, mirrors a real event that happened, if that's the sort of thing that sparked the awareness of this for journalists, uh, for the police, if there was a real woman or if this is an amalgam uh, that you created this character in order to tell the story. It's more an amalgam, yeah. It's more an amalgam of many stories I've heard um, from Peru, from other countries too. Um, yeah, it wasn't exactly like that. I kept some some things, but uh, but I I didn't want to go. I met some some of the mothers, but I didn't want to go there to that moment with them. I just didn't feel it was fair to make them go through this memory step by step. I just knew what had happened, and thought, okay, well, let's let's build it this way. And I know that. For example, one of them, her children um, got stolen uh, when they were kids already, like six and seven, more or less. So yeah, it wasn't just like when they were born, but but still it was the same thing. She came back and they to pick them up. It was more of a daycare situation. She came back from work to pick them up and they were not there. And, it's just my, yeah, I just, she never told me, oh, you scream this way and that, you know, but I could imagine this was the case. Um, tell us a little bit about casting Georgina. Is it, first of all, is that, that part of the film um, in Quechua? Uh, it, the, the Quechua, it's uh, beginning and I think some other parts, yeah, she's Quechua. So, so give us a sense of what the casting process was like. Well, yeah, I, I decided to go to, it wasn't a conventional casting. I decided to go to uh, the neighborhood that we were going to represent, right? Um, it's sort of an emblematic neighborhood in Lima. It's called Villa El Salvador. And um, it's, uh, it has a history a little bit like you see in the film. They began with nothing. They just uh, took uh, some mats and began their houses that way at the end of the 70s. Um, and well, it was a continuous process and thousands of people uh, did that. Uh, most of them, they were running away from the um, civil war we had, the internal war, mm -hmm. war they call it, uh, between Shining Path and the military. So that, and this took part, it took place in the Andes, right? So they were between fires. They were accused of being terrorists from the, the military accused them of that and by the vice versa, the Shining Pad accused them of collaborating with the government. So anyway, the peasants had to, to run away and that's where in a way the way the movie starts, right? With them in those conditions in the outskirts of Lima. So for the casting, I decided to go to that uh, neighborhood because um, they have a lot of small theaters there. Mm. And I thought, why would I go to a casting house, uh, you know, um, where I'm most likely I'm going to find uh, people who are white and in a way privileged when I want to portray an a privileged community, so it's much more interesting to go, to go there, right? So that's what I did, and they were super open and kind, and they said, yeah, you can do your casting here. Sure, take our theater, have a beautiful three-story theater called uh, Sand and Maths, in a way to remember the way they started. And um, the director of that theater told me about Pamela, he showed me a picture on Facebook and I thought, wow, this, this, you know, everything has been so difficult with this film, but some things were gifts. So I thought, wow, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, somebody that's joyful and, but still, um, you know, you can see that she's gone through a lot. Uh, she's um, sweet, but also, uh, you know, strong, hard, you no. Know? 
Uh, so we we reunited and it was great. She had training. She had trained for one year. She had some, she's an anthropologist. She had some issues in her school. And in a way, thank God she had those issues because she stopped going to, to college for more than a year. And during that time, she started doing activism and theater. Mm -hmm. uh, theater of the press, they, they call it. No, a theater that's supposed to uh, tell your own story and your, to your community, to educate, to advocate. Uh, for women, women's rights, indigenous rights, etc. And she studied uh, physical theater for a year. So when she came to the casting, you could already see that she was super conscious of what the body can do for an actor, right? So I was super impressed. And then from there, it just took me a long time to give her the, the part because I was very nervous that, you know, if, if she had not worked and then the film collapses <laughs> so it took me some time but I always knew she was the best what, what was the moment that made you decide perhaps when I I put her together with Tommy I I made a session with both of them and it worked so naturally mm -hmm. um, finally <laughs> it was like oh, I was seeing the film so I thought okay Everything is working. She's she's so good. She's committed. She she's she's she was already earning a lot of gaining a lot of weight because um, she's a really thin, really. Thin. That was the only thing that was stopping me. Also, mm -hmm. yeah, she she didn't seem to have just to be nine nine months pregnant or just giving birth. Um, but she said, "No worries, I'll. I know what to do. I know what to ha what to eat for dinner." <laughs> And she started gaining, gaining, and uh, even though she didn't have the part, she she was already, yeah. she knew somehow. And uh, yeah, when when I saw them together, I thought, okay, I am sure now. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the the uh, the beautiful aesthetics of the film because you're talking about memories. It also feels sort of dreamlike, you know, and maybe memory and dreams are sort of you know connected. Um, but between the, the black and white and the aspect ratio, it really feels like you're transported to another world. Um, did you have that in mind when you started the project or was that something that developed as the story came together? I definitely had in mind to bring the spectator to another world. That, that for sure. I, I wanted that, uh, but I didn't know how. I just didn't, I just knew that I was going to use every tool I had with the low budget <laughs> that I, I could use. So I figured, okay, so, well, in the 80s, our memory of the 80s is black and white because the photographs of the newspapers were printed in black and white. So this, this might help. Also, this may help to give us some distance to, to I, I really like that. Um, idea no it's a breaking idea i guess that uh you should allow the spectator to think to think not to just to have a little bit of distance no bring bring the spectator but uh also let let them think um and with some calm also i just didn't want to make it this is already terrible i'm not gonna make it even more mm -hmm. And I thought the black and white could give us that. Um, also, the four by three also would bring us to the eighties because it's like that's the TV, no, the TV standard. And also, I thought several of reasons. I thought um, it's a very humble format, and our protagonist is very humble. So I thought everything that I can do to to be on her shoes. Mm. Yes. To, so I think that's in a way what happened to her and to all of us uh, in those days, we didn't see the future. Mm -hmm. So it, it wouldn't make sense for me to move too much the camera to, to have a, a wide uh, frame because we had no horizons, you know? You feel like that. 
when your surroundings, surroundings the politics especially seem to fall apart. Um, I'm, I'm curious if there's any, if there were any complications or challenges in recreating the 80s from, you know, uh, the political violence that's happening in the background to the rallies. Um, what were, what was that process like for you in terms of research and then execution through production design and uh, anything that might have gone into um, the political yeah. background? Well, yeah, we have a lot of material in the public library. So we, we made a, a big uh, compilation of materials, um, visual photographs, um, all kinds of things like advertising, uh, news, everything that we could use, uh, we put in a big book. Um, so the big the complication was in the end because we had to erase some things like when we, all those um images in the jungle we call it it's iquitos the the amazon town um the town the amazon um I, we had to erase use a lot of special effects to erase the internet uh, antennas and cables and things like this um yes and then some political propaganda <laughs> that's contemporary things like this um but apart from that it, it was fine we raised a couple of cars i think also um that's yeah. something that you don't even think of when you watch a movie like this that there's someone in there like painting out things removing things that are too anachronistic yeah like every film these days <laughs> <laughs> yeah um also that rally that you see that's contemporary it was oh. just yeah and it came from a bad day uh one location got canceled and we were like oh no this is a disaster and then we were waiting outside and we saw this rally and it was just a lot of old people rallying and their clothes were were not very modern or fashionable at all they were like you know they could be 80s and they were all old people i don't know i guess they were retired protesting for something i don't know but we just rushed and stole that shot yeah uh, i mean dare i ask what what does that entail in terms of uh uh was there a rush to get releases at some point or are they just unwittingly in the film now they are in the film, I think, but you can barely see any. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. I just want to ask one one quick thing about the um, uh, the fact that the film is representing Peru for the Oscars, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. And just to let everyone else in the audience know that if this is your first time, what I like to do is pull questions from the Q and A box, and then invite people over so that you can turn on your video and ask your question live. Um, so that I'll, I'll put together a running order uh, in just a moment. But um, I, I am very interested when uh, a film represents a country, but then of course the things that it's saying are, um, you know, expose a, a, a dark period in that country's history. Um, what was the process? I mean, it's, the film was quite successful. So tell, tell us a little bit about how it was received in Peru, and then how it came to become the, the Peruvian uh, Oscar entry, just, you know, aside from the fact that it's a devastating and gorgeous film, it is, it is also a very, um, it's a political one. So um, what was that like? Well, we premiered only three weeks ago, I think, at this point, January 15th. Um, and yeah, it's it, we're still in the middle of receiving comments and it, everything is online, but uh, I think it's been very positive, the reaction. A lot of people watched it. It was like the top 10 in Netflix. So that was nice. Um, we, we didn't plan to release it on, net, on Netflix. We wanted to go to movie theaters in April last year, but of course with the pandemic, we had to cancel. And we were waiting for movie theaters to come back, but it was not happening. So we said, 
okay, Netflix is seem to be a very good option. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's been very warm in general. Of course, some people have complaints and this and that, but in general, it's been it's been good. We just had some homophobic attacks, but hey, that's well, and yeah, that's the other part of it as well. They're sort of expected, yeah. It's, it's, country is is really backwards still and i guess the the most common comment now is that it's so sad that we haven't changed much uh, you would think we have changed if you come to the five neighborhoods in lima where it looks like you know south korea or whatever um been there <laughs> but now it's fantastic but yeah yeah, the pandemic, it's its shown as that. It's pretty much the same, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it looks like we got a couple of questions that uh, the audience is asking me to read. Um, so let me just quickly ask, uh, did the Sendero Luminoso have a role in the child selling, the churches? Did Sendero Luminoso have any role in the child selling? No, no, that's their, no. I mean, they were definitely the Shining Path is known for kidnapping people, for sure, indigenous people, and not just a dozen, hundreds, hundreds of kids uh, got kidnapped by Shining Path, especially in the, in the selva, in the jungle no? uh, of Peru, and they, yeah. But no, not in this movie. No, it, it's not in that link is not intended. The, the link was um, in a way we added that aspect in the film that Leo is joining Shining Path to say, look, this is crazy. We, I, I, most Peruvians hate Shining Path. But on the other hand, it's like they had a reason to exist. To exist. They, it's not like they were crazy <laughs> and they just lost it. There is a seat of violence that is gonna find resistance, peaceful resistance in some people and it's gonna hide more violence in some other. That's why Leo is, is there. But, yeah. um, okay, this question comes from John and he also wanted me to read it. Uh, I would love to know more about the cinematography, the, the decisions regarding aspect ratio, what it was shot on. It's so well done that it looks like historical international cinema. Thank you for that. Um, the director of photography is very experienced. His name is Inti Briones. He's Peruvian, Chilean, and um, he works in Brazil nowadays. Um, the decisions, as I mentioned, were in a way practical uh, to use these tools to bring the spectator to another world, to the world of the 80s and not only of the 80s, but of our memory and feel emotional memory of the 80s. Um, and also um, there was something that um, about the aspect ratio that was telling me it's right for Georgina, it's humble, it's not pretentious, it's not, um, I never wanted the film to be to feel like um, we are looking at this world from above and we're examining these people um, or from outside and then they are like exotic or something. It's more like we, it's our experience. That was the, what we wanted to do. And therefore all the decisions in the photography were sort of following that. Um, okay, I'm gonna start <clears throat> bringing some people over and uh, I'm going, just for everyone watching, I'm gonna bring a few people over at once so that we don't lose too much time, um, but keep your camera off until, until we call on you, just so that it's not, you know, uh, a whole bunch of people all at once. So I'm gonna start with Carol. I didn't know how to get my camera on. Oh, uh, quickly, I want to tell you, I thought it was absolutely a gorgeous film. I was in Peru in 1985.
time. And this film seems so real to me. Um, I had two questions. One, what's your background? And two, the props for the dancing, did you create those or were those real? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, well, the props for the dancing, they were real. The actor, Leo, was a dancer, a Caesar dancer. So he just brought his costume. Um, so yeah, and what was the other question? Oh, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, oh, you, background. you now have a film that's representing an entire country. <laughs> yeah. well, how did you get to where you are? <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, well, we, I studied film um, at Columbia University in New York. Um, before that, I was studying communications in Peru. Um, and before that, I was uh, in high school. <laughs> um, basically, I, I guess I'll just say that from a very early age, I fell in love with arts in general. Um, I fell in love with those theater, group, theater groups that were around me that were um, doing Indian, um, that were showing pe the people in the cities and the people who are not so connected with their Andean traditions, they were doing that. They were mixing avant-garde theater with Andean cultures. Um, so I guess, and they were doing a lot of music today. So that whole thing stayed with me. And then I don't know why exactly I changed to film and forgot theater or dance theater. Um, but I guess the fascination with um, the possibility of reaching a lot of people, traveling and approaching people um, in a different way, I guess. And perhaps it's a matter of personality too. Um, but I think it started very early when with this fascination with the theater groups. Thank you. Thank you, Caro, for the question. Um, okay, so we should have uh, Judith uh, next. <clears throat> Do you wanna, there we go. Here I am. I, yes, I actually saw this film more than a year ago. Um, I think it was at the AFI Film Festival. Did it show there? Yes. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, so I, you, I did not watch it again, I, but I wanted to hear the Q&A. Did any of these mothers get reunited with their children? And if so, what was the mechanism? Yeah, two of them. The first one was the one that called my father. And then she... Uh, met the, another mother and helped her reunite with her two kids. But how many children in all disappeared? They don't know. They don't know. Uh, but they they calculate at least uh, fifty or more. Mm -hmm. But only these three kids reunited so far. Um, I know that the first French lady is trying still to reunite some people, but so far I've only heard of those three. It was a beautiful film and it stayed with me all this time. And the actress, the main actress was wonderful. Thank you, yes. We all um, are, you know, Pamela and her commitment and her strength. Yes, thank you for that. Um, okay, next up we have uh, Gloria. Hi. Huh? Um, yes. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you because that film, if I were giving the Oscars, I would separate one for you. <laughs> it, the, the cinematography is so, it's excellent. And what's interesting is, and the subject of course gets to your heart. I was thinking that this is a movie mostly for women, but even Alessandro was touched by, by, by it, I could tell. And um, 
even though it's in black and white, and I knew, I knew that she was never gonna know where the baby was, but the, the action keeps your interest till the very end. It, it was just great, it was just great. Uh, my question was, are you aware of the cases in Mexico, the women in Juarez? And if you are, would you even consider making a movie about those cases? I would, yes, I would. I, I am aware of that. Um, yeah, it's, it's very well known in the world what's happening in Juarez. Um, and yeah, of course, I, at some point, I would love to, to speak about that. I know that many, I don't know about filmmakers, but I know that many journalists uh, risk their lives to tell those stories. So yeah, I have my admiration. I've never seen a movie um, regarding that subject. Yeah. Because of the danger that it entails. So at least I know it's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. At least when it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you for this film. It's, it's, it's really, it's really good. Good luck at the Academy Awards. <laughs> thank you, Gloria. I'll keep your Oscar. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Thanks, Gloria. Okay, I think we have uh, Hermione. Hello. Hello? Yes, I'm sorry I'm not on camera. I just wanted to commend you on such a poignant, meaningful film. It just pulled all your emotions in so many directions and it's wonderful work on all counts, the cinematography, the storyline, the acting was excellent. But I just wondered, did you consider when you cast um, Tommy as Pedro, did you have any thoughts about his strong resemblance to Lou Diamond Phillips? No, Diamond, no. Uh, <laughs> he, I had to keep looking and actually I clicked off and I, I, I had to do a search on the cast because we have an actor here. He was in the movie La Bamba. He's been in a lot of movies, but he yeah. looks so much like Lou Diamond Phillips. And it was distracting for a while. I just wondered, well, I guess you don't know who he is, but a lot of older people would probably know who are movie buffs. I'm like, how did they get Lou Diamond Phillips in this movie? And I know he wouldn't be that, you know, that young, but it was just amazing, the uh, resemblance. So you did a wonderful job in the casting. It was just, it was wonderful, powerful movie. And excuse me, the question is really silly, but I just had to know, did you consider it at all? No, I'm gonna write it down. It's the first time I hear I hear about it that I can totally see what you're saying. I can yes, totally thank I don't know you. Background, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, he's a Tommy. Tommy is an excellent actor, but he looks so much like Lou Diamond, Diamond Phillips. It was amazing. He has to be some relation to him, but you did a wonderful job on all counts. It's powerful film. I I wish you all the best, and I hope you win that Oscar. You deserve it. <laughs> Thank you so much. A nomination movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I had, yeah, I didn't think about that. But uh, I don't know his background, Lu Louis D Diamond Phillips, but uh, probably he has some Latin American background. Oh, definitely. Yeah, if you if you Google him, you will see the, the resemblance. It's, re it's crazy. Yeah. I'm like, is this Lou Diamond Phillips' son? Or yeah. it was just really crazy. But excuse me for the silly question, because the movie is no, too powerful no, for no, something no. so silly. I, I love your question. Because, you know, <laughs> it's like some of them are like, you know, lighter than others. And it brings mm -hmm. color and joy. Well, it's thank you. We shouldn't hear. <laughs> too far off topic, but I have to say the st the resemblance is really striking. Yes, yes, yes. Now that she said, I couldn't agree more. And I, I just have to say it's it's very Latin American. The, the reason why I I wanted Tommy in the film is not only that he's a great actor, but also that I love that his face shows you in a way what Peru or Latin America is. It's this mix of so many 
uh, races, right? Like it's he's a bit indigenous, a bit sort of Asian, a bit sort of white, a bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah, um, he he quite. was great. Yeah, on all counts, he every beat. He just he's going to get a lot of work from this film. He really is. Yeah, so. all of the actors were powerful. But he really, with the with the resemblance and and his, he's so professional and so natural. He's going to get a lot of work. I really, really commend you for this. But I just wondered if you kind of thought this might be a little catch to have him look so much like Lou Diamond Phillips, because <laughs> I'm like it's distracting. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't want to take up any more time. Excellent work. Thanks for the laugh. <laughs> Um, okay, we should have Steve. Good evening. Uh, hello, Melina and, and Alex. And uh, I'd like to also get on the bandwagon and uh, thank you for a beautiful film, even though Alex said uh, it's quite devastating too. I had a quick comment then a question. Uh, the comment was um, the character or Georgina, I, I could have sworn that she was not uh, an actress. She was so natural that I felt that you just pick somebody that, you know, basically lived there that hadn't had any acting experience at all. It's like she lived the part. So I think she did an absolutely wonderful job. Uh, my question is, is do you know what happened to any of the, the judges or other people from 1981 uh, that went on trial uh, for this uh, basically child stealing ring. Yeah, I, they they went to jail and they got released um, early. Early, I think they had like a third of their the time that they were supposed to do. Um, so it then, sounds like uh, kind of what Alex was referring to. Uh, you know, earlier that there's probably a good chance that there might have been some higher up politicians involved uh, along with police or whatever, uh, if they were able to get off so easy. You think yeah. So? Yeah, probably that's the case. That's, that's exactly what we are experiencing. Like today, a corrupt um, member of what it would be an equivalent of the Supreme Court in the US, finally, Finally, after we all knew he was involved in corrupt um, actions, finally he got uh, dismissed. From... So this is fairly common that you know, higher powers are involved because otherwise it wouldn't be possible. Well, I wish you luck in the Oscars. It's a very, very, very beautiful film, very touching. All right, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Night. Um, okay, we have our last question from uh, Natasha. Hi. Hi, Natasha. Hi, I really, really loved your film, like everyone said. Um, it was really beautiful and, and visceral, and I like I was transported, like everyone said, it was just yeah, all those things. Um, and I really, you know, those, those, it was just the authenticity of what you said. I really felt it in the actors, and it's, you know, of course, in the scenes with, um, like, you know, the really, you know, this is like tough scenes where she's having the baby and when she's screaming, but I also really felt it with Pedro and the actor. And it was so, they felt so authentic and they weren't, and I just felt like it was a really beautiful, like a little love story. And I also just, I don't know, I just didn't expect that. And I just, it was really beautiful. And I just want to ask, and I know Alex already asked um, a question about like, doing that and, and having like an LGBTQ like narrative. I'm just wondering if there's ever a moment in your process where you were asked to make it a heteronormative narrative and if you considered it or like what it was like to uh, be firm and stay with your vision. Cause I think it was just like your vision was so clear in this movie. And I think that's something really just powerful. Thank you so much for that. I was never asked to, to make him uh, hetero normative is that the word um but um i i was definitely asked to make his part shorter and we did and we did but the only reason why i did it i think is because um somebody told me it's not that it's bad it's um just that georgina's story is killing me and 
I want to know, and I, you are taking her away from me too much. So when when this person um, said that, I understood. Okay, we're gonna definitely have this little love story that I I thought was so important uh, to talk about because it's like one, it's like the most personal thing. Love is like dying in this film, right? Like the love for a for a daughter, the love between Georgina and Leo, everything is like dying. So I thought something has to leave, something has to be born, you know? So it's not like, it's not like that. You know, it's like, and even in the pandemic, you, know, you, you, you start seeing like we are communicating now, you know, we've managed, humans manage, manage to, to, to bring life. And I thought it has to exist, just should be at least you know, more moderate, so that Georgina, um, so that we are not on the way of Georgina. But thank you for that, because I had to, in that regard, I had to be firm, also listened, but be firm at the same yeah, time. Yeah, definitely both, because I think what was there was perfect. And, and what you said about wanting to have this flawed character, and I think that, like, it really, yeah, it just, it's really powerful. So I do, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you, Melina, so much for, for joining us. I know you're a few hours ahead of us, I, I think, right? So, um, it's, uh, it's really such a special film and I, I wish you the best of luck. I know that the, uh, Oscar shortlist voting is happening, um, pretty much this week. So, uh, I really look forward to seeing the film, um, progress through the, through the process. And uh, I, you are absolutely welcome to campus anytime uh, when the pandemic's over. Uh, if you happen to be in Los Angeles, I'd love to be able to uh, share your work with our students uh, in person in a theater. Um, and thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you, Alex. That idea would be fantastic. Hope we can make it happen one day. Stay safe and best wishes. Good night. Good night. Thank you.